Yeah, he is a monster piano player. We're definitely going to get into how he became a monster piano player. But first, we're going to do our favorite segment, Elton John by the numbers. The first number that I'm going to throw out is 85. And that is the number of tracks recorded and released, not just recorded, but recorded and released by Elton John between June 1969 and October 1973. That man is putting out volume of material. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Wow. The next number is over 300 million, and that is the number of records that Elton John has sold over the course of his career, which I don't know how many other people can claim an over 300 million number? Dolly Parton's over 100 million. Who else is in the over 300 million club? It's got to be pretty. Like maybe Bruce Springsteen? Right. I don't know. Michael, Michael, yeah. Jackson. Michael Jackson. Yeah. 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 The Eagles. And the Eagles, uh, maybe. No, no. I'm talking about fighter. one person. I'm talking uh, about a person. Oh, I feel you. Yeah. Okay. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. A band. Okay. Yeah. It's really impressive. And to add to that, the next number is one of 19. And that Elton John is one of only 19 people to ever EGOT, which is to win an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, and a Tony. Whoa, I didn't know that. Yeah, that man's accomplishments are vast. Right. Do you happen to know what he won the Emmy for? I think I can guess the other ones, bro. I actually don't know. He was on Suddenly Susan. Let's see. I don't Mystery know. Mystery solved, obviously. <laughs> 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 I feel like it's, I'm actually surprised the number is as high as it is, even though it's still it's rarefied air, of course, and congratulations to him. But Oh, you know what? Yeah. He won it for Elton John Farewell from Dodger Stadium. The Emmy, the Emmy was the last one that he won. Right. And it was a show in like 2018. Oh wow! So this, um, what I'm saying is that there was a certain point where egotting became a thing. I remember Tracy Jordan talking about it on Thirty Rock, for instance. But yeah. that must have been relatively early in when it became a term, and then people started kind of going for it. You're like, "What's the last piece of this puzzle? Oh, I need to do the thing I do, but do it on TV." That's a pretty yeah. good way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the next song, the next number that I'm going to throw out there is 22 songs. Over two weeks, which is the amount of songs that were recorded for this album, which equals more than one and a half songs recorded per day, recorded and finished per and day. Done, right. Now, they only released 17 of them, 18 if you count uh, the first track as two distinct tracks. But I'm going to give you a little counterpoint to that, which is another album released in 1973, Dark Side of the Moon, has 10 tracks and was recorded over 60 days. Yeah. Now, they're not an it's not an apples to oranges. <laughs> sure. I sure. understand. It's yeah. not so much money on that one. Right. <laughs> no, no, there's not a lot of moneyness on that one. But I do think that it really goes to show that he was able to perform on command and they could knock these songs out. And on most of them knock them out of the fucking park. Because I don't hear a whole lot of like, oh, they should have redone that. There's a little flub on that one. Yeah. Most They're being the operative awesome. word, right? What is the Most, Jamaican yeah. jerk off of Dark Side? Do we think? Oh, goodness, <laughs> ah, I've never really been a big fan of Us and Them, but I could never put those two songs <laughs> in the same place together. <laughs> All right, the next number is fifty which is the number of top 40 hits Elton John has had in his career, including nine number one songs. 50. That's wild. 50, 50. top 40 hits. Yeah. 50. That's a lot of My hits. God. That is, I have to say, that is one thing. I, I probably read that number this week, but certainly I looked through these lists of songs and even touching this album, I recognize so many more songs than I was expecting to. Yeah. Not by title, but but by listening to them. And that just tells you how ubiquitous his music has been. Yeah. And like universally appealable, right? Like every, mm -hmm. I, I, not everybody's going to like Elton John, but I don't know if there, there's many people are like, I fucking hate Elton John. I can't stand <laughs> right. him. Like, oh right. my God, shut up. Can you feel my dick tonight? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> The next number 
This is an interesting segue. The next number is <laughs> two, which is the number of women that Elton John has been engaged to, including one that he was married to for four years. No kidding. I was really? not aware of that. Yes. Wow. Yeah. I kind of thought, so that is interesting. Maybe we'll get into that. But I was thinking that it was likely an open secret, I suppose. I mean, you look at his stage show in 1973, mm -hmm. and it's full of drag queens. And it's, how could, I don't know. It was just how could anyone people. not know? Yeah, yeah, and he also like everybody's is everybody in on the joke as Bernie Taupin is writing songs like My Woman, My Girl, My Love, and he's singing them. I assume everyone's just like, well, he's just the singer. Or are they like, oh, no, he's straight, but just mm -hmm. very flamboyant or extravagant. I don't know what the mood or the tone was in, in you know, 1973. There's some foreshadowing in that, Adam. So we'll Ooh, cover that a little bit excellent. later. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. And then the last number that we're going to cover, which is actually the number that blew my mind the most, is zero, which is the number of songs that Elton John and Bernie Taupin have written in the same room together. They have never written a song in the same room. Bernie will write and give it to Elton, and Elton will go to a different location and write the melody. And Elton has no input on the lyrics and Bernie has no input on the melody whatsoever. God damn if it doesn't work. I mean, right? Like that's it remarkable. mostly works. It mostly yeah, yeah, yeah. works, yeah, right. but it does suffer occasionally. I've come more around after this week to Bernie Toppin's lyric writing style, but some of these lyrics are pretty they I don't like the idea of singing them at piano, even though I love the idea of playing the chords and singing the songs. Yes, and I will say i am very much in agreement with you rob i going into this week had this whole scheme for how i was going to do the outline which was like and then elton john meeks hack fraud bernie Taupin, and like <laughs> i was going to shit on him the entire time because i don't particularly think that he is a fantastic lyric writer but i have had a much greater appreciation for his contribution after listening this week and then researching and all that stuff so Bernie, lucky you. I'm not going to completely shit on you in this episode. I'm sure you were very, very concerned about that because Bernie <laughs> Taupin, as I'm sure you all know, is one of our Patreon subscribers. <laughs> <laughs> Segway. Well so done. We are just about to release the fourth episode in our March Radness bracket, the best song of the 1980s, available on our Patreon page. Hop on over there if you want to subscribe five bucks a month we would love it buy us a beer listen to some good content give us some feedback either way we love you for listening to the show we are thrilled to do this every week and thrilled that people are thrilled that we are doing this every week we feel the love in the emails 1001 album complaints at gmail if you want to write us in recommend us to a friend give us five stars any of that stuff we would certainly appreciate it now let's get to the background of Elton John leading up to this album. Are we all ready? Let's do this thing. Let's do it. I'm actually not ready. I'm going to grab beer real quick. Here. That's cool. <laughs> now, folks, if you're a Patreon member, you're going to be like me because I didn't actually, I wasn't a part of the 80s radness. So I'm hoping that episode four has some glass tiger in there. I don't know. We'll have to see. Did Glass Tiger make it into the? I don't even know what you're talking about. What are you fucking Marty over here? Come on, <laughs> that song. Don't forget me. I uh, don't forget me when I'm gone. My Come heart on, will no. break. Da, da, da. Oh, it's a great tune. Uh, I don't, I don't think, think I've ever heard that song. Guy, you know what? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I know the song, but all right, yeah, but it's probably it's not. not it's not. <laughs> we were going for good Spoiler songs. Alert. So. <laughs> oh, oh, good songs. I'm sorry. Yes. All right. We are, of course, talking about Reginald Dwight, born March 25th, 1947 in Pinner, which is a suburb in the northwest of London. Now, you hear London suburb, and these days, you know, London suburb is like relatively cosmopolitan, but I get the impression that it was actually kind of country at the time, a little provincial. He is the child of Stanley and Sheila, Dwight. He is Sheila's only child. Sheila and Stanley divorce, and Stanley has other kids. 
but he's primarily raised in the home of Sheila's parents. One of the reasons why is because Stanley was in the Royal Air Force, and so he'd be away from the family a lot. But it does sound like their marriage was pretty rocky, and I'm not going to think I'm telling tales out of school here when I say that Stanley sounds like an asshole. Apparently, he was incredibly strict, but like nonsensibly strict. And I read for this week Elton John's biography, Me, which was quite good. It was very engaging. And one of the things that he talks about there is that his dad would just fly off the handle and scream at him for like the most random things. He distinctly remembers being yelled at one time for taking his jacket off the wrong way and for chewing celery incorrectly. Like, mm. these are the kind of things that make your kids walk on eggshells around you at all times. Like, I don't know what I could possibly do to not anger you at this point. Quick callback to our Super Furry Animals episode where <laughs> Sir Paul McCartney was called in for a small studio cameo of chewing celery on tape. So I guess Elton was not in the running for that. No, no. And I'm sure that Elton's dad, Stanley, had some hard opinions about that one. <laughs> So his parents were fighting a lot, and Elton says that from a very young age, he used music as an escape from that kind of tumultuous environment. Every time his parents would fight, he'd go to his room, and he would listen to the radio. What he would listen to, he specifically called out, was Radio Luxembourg, which was a Luxembourg-based radio station that had an English program that was aired in uh, Ireland and in Great Britain. Mm. He said that this filled his head not only with dreams of music and potentially being a musician, but also just kind of seeing the wider world and getting out of that provincial town that he was in. And he had friends, certainly, but he always said that music was his best friend. And from a very young age, it was obvious that he was a naturally intuitive piano player. His grandparents had a piano in the house and he was always drawn to it. And we're talking like before he was seven years old, he could play pretty much anything he heard from ear. Ah, okay. No sheet music. You'd play him a song and he could figure the song out and play it, which is pretty crazy, especially considering that he said that one of his favorite artists was this Trinidadian piano player called Winifred Atwell. And she was like a boogie woogie kind of stride player. And so he's doing left hand, right hand stuff. He's not Jeez. just plinking out melodies. Right, he right. is listening to it and being like, oh yeah, I'm getting this ba-doom, 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 going on. Which, Rob, I know you're like very much dedicating yourself to the piano right now. I can't imagine that that boogie woogie stride style is easy to just not you know. in the least. It's remarkably yeah. hard. And it's one of these things where, at least in my experience, every every separate hand rhythm you nail. It takes a lot of time and it doesn't seem to transfer that easily to the next one. <laughs> right. Yeah. So this is all before the age of seven, because he doesn't start taking piano lessons until he is seven. When his mom and his grandparents are like, Hey, you're like pretty good at the piano. We should probably do something to foster this. And he starts taking piano lessons at the age of seven. And he ends up winning a scholarship at the age of 11 to the Royal Academy of Music. Now, it doesn't mean that he's going to the Royal Academy of Music full time, but they have like a program for basically really good, young, kind of freakishly good kid. young kids. Right, right. And he okay. gets into that. And apparently this was I watched the movie Rocket Man a while ago, and I thought that it was an embellishment of a scene. But apparently he in one of his very early sessions with an instructor the instructor plays this kind of complicated handle piece and he just plays it back flawlessly. First time hearing it, plays it back flawlessly. And then is also like, she's like, oh, like, I didn't know that you could like sight read and play along that. He's like, I can't read music. I just heard you play that and I just played it. Wow. And she's like, well, first of all, you should learn how to read music because you clearly have a lot of natural talent. And if you can marry those two things together, you're going to be a force to be reckoned with. And then he starts getting this education that's like very rooted in the classics. You know, he's learning Bach, he's learning Chopin, all that stuff. But his first love is rock and roll. Not necessarily his first love, but he is in love with rock and roll because 
at this point on the scene in Britain, he's like, you know, 11, 12, 13 years old. So we're talking like late 50s, early 60s. You start getting Jerry Lee Lewis, Little Richard, Ray Charles. These kinds of people are hitting the scene and he is just obsessed with rock and roll. So he's getting gigs at a very young age. Again, he's like 12, 13 years old and his mom is taking him to this local pub and he's the entertainment at the pub. He's playing the piano at a pub, entertaining drunk ass fucking downtrodden English countryside adults. Old grizzled <laughs> men with beards and <laughs> staffs and dudes who waiters. just <laughs> defeated the Nazis and shit like that. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. 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 Beards so, and staffs. I like that image. That's good. <laughs> yes. That's a hell of a bar. I want to go to that bar. <laughs> yes, that actually does sound pretty great. So he is 14 at the time. He's put in a lot of hours as a solo piano player. And then at 15, he forms a band called Bluesology with some friends. Now, it might be disingenuous to say that they were friends because everybody, I, I watched some interviews with the guys from Bluesology and they were like, Elton was a fucking nerd. Like, <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> We all had long hair and like we're dressing cool. And he had on like a suit and a very conservative haircut. And he had these Buddy Holly glasses on, which were an affectation. He did not have poor sight, but he thought that like Buddy Holly was the epitome of like a cool oh, look you should go for. Right, so he's wearing right. glasses. He couldn't hang out with them afterwards. He was like total fucking square. But they basically said as soon as he sat down to play the piano, they were like, oh, yeah, we don't care. We'll deal You're with in. it. Right. We'll deal with your awkwardness. You are in my friend. Right. And honestly, it is, I think it speaks to how good he is that everybody said that even though he was like the youngest guy in the band and the dorkiest guy in the band, he was the guy who glued the band together musically because everything that they brought to him, he just learned immediately and then saw the implications of it and was like, oh, this chord here, how would we do this instead? And then you should do this. And like, they were just, it was just so natural for him that yeah. he could hear the possibilities of a song from your shitty sketch of a song and just be able to immediately be like, oh, this is what we should do. We all need that friend. The guy you come up to, they're like, I have this turd. I have two chords. Can you, hey, this yeah. is an amazing ballad now. I mean, Adam, I, in high school, you were that friend for me. No. <laughs> <laughs> and you're saying you still need that friend for yourself. It shows you what yes. I was. <laughs> I was going to say the piano, I do think he's a really excellent composer and that the piano as an instrument, I've been realizing over these years, is a great compositional tool because you sort of have this whole orchestra in front of you based on the range of it. And the musical theory of how you arrange and tell people what to do i don't know it just it makes a little more sense that a piano player is going to be preternaturally good at that fair enough yeah it is entirely laid out in front of you but like, we i was talking about this instrument. yeah yeah i was talking about this actually on that car ride with our friend james the other day about how like non-intuitive the guitar is as an interface it doesn't make any fucking sense like it works but you don't look at it and be like oh i see how that works you have to muscle memory get it and piano right. is a little bit more visual in that way yeah and you're constantly having to do math to understand the intervals of the strings and then they themselves are not even consistent whereas the piano which is this very distance equals intervallic distance you know physical yeah. distance equals intervallic distance totally. and so there's there's just something to it and i notice it i do hear it a lot in elton's playing i think he is a very powerful player but i think specifically it's the composition it's the idea of of voice leading how he phrases his chords i think is really interesting almost to the point of being jazzy i think that's his his real strength yeah yeah definitely one of the other things that all the members of bluesology said is that he was much more serious about making it as a professional musician than anyone else in the band they were all kind of just like we're doing it to be the cool guys and get laid and you know have a good time and stuff like that and he was like no i'm going to make it as a professional musician this is what i want to do with my life i'm destined for bigger things than just some knock around local band playing in the pubs so by the time he hits 17 he's determined he's going to leave school and start his career as a musician he goes to the headmaster of his school a man who he said terrified him and he went to him and he said listen I want to drop out and start working as a professional musician. And the headmaster says, 
I can see how much this means to you. I know that you are destined for this because I've been observing you and I care about you. You have my blessing. The only thing that I ask is that you work hard and give it your all. And then he goes to his dad and he says, I want to be a professional musician. His dad said, you should be a banker, <laughs> which I just thought was like the distant headmaster who like terrified him and he never interacted with was like, I know more about what's in your soul than your own fucking your dad does. Father. Go be yeah. a banker. Oh yeah. God. Could you imagine Elton John as a banker? He would have been miserable. With miserable. that hat, that lampshade hat with the frills <laughs> as he's up there taking the money right. from the window. Much That's harder crazy. to wear angel wings at that job. <laughs> All right. So Elton does drop out of school and he sets to work trying to get Bluesology to take the next step. And like many bands in the era, the next step is to try to get a single recorded. You can use that to get gigs. You can use that to get written up in the paper. You can use that to potentially get a record contract. And so they get a chance to record a single. And it's a song that Elton has written, and it's called Come Back Baby. And at the time, Elton is just the piano player in the band. But apparently they don't like the singer's presentation of this song. So they have Elton John sing it. And he sounds like Elton John. He's 17 years old and he sounds like a 46 year old man because Elton John has always <laughs> kind of had middle aged man voice, right. but it's really kind of crazy. And Elton said, like, I should not have sung that. We should have had a professional singer. I think he might just be being humble. It's an OK song, but it's it's a song written by a 17 year old. Like most of those songs suck. Are There's pretty not a lot crap, of 17 year olds right? putting out fantastically orchestrated songs. But they have a single and they use that to basically get booked to an agency that is using them to be opening for all of these R&B acts that are coming through London. Apparently, this agency, their whole thing was they were taking American R&B acts that were not able to break through in the American scene. And they were like, the kids in London are crazy for R&B right now. They don't care. It doesn't have to be fucking Smokey Robinson. We can bring in anybody. And so they were bringing in these American R&B acts and having them play in the club scene and, uh, and Bluesology was opening up for them. And the thing that is very important about this aspect is that these people were road dogs. They had been trying to make it in America for like 10 years. They have a ton of stage experience. And Elton says it was just like a masterclass in terms oh, of crowd right. control and yeah. how to present your songs and get people into it. And he's just like taking notes, picking up all these tricks from these people. And these are mostly black acts that have been not able to make it in America. And so he's taken this kind of soulful country American sound and putting this kind of like British sheen on it in his own playing. And I found that one of the biggest ironies is that these were black acts that could not make it in America. So they came to London and then Elton basically takes their shtick and goes to America and makes it huge and makes a ton of money off of it. Well, it's always the way. Yeah, yes, racism. The Ooh, all right. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So it really leveled him up. It made him a better songwriter. And part of the reason it made him a better songwriter is because it allowed him to be able to read a crowd better and see what crowds are responding to and then incorporate that in future songs. And at this point, it's 1967, and Bluesology just becomes subsumed and becomes the backing band for Long John, Long John Baldry. Hey! Uh, from yeah. Rod Stewart. Yeah, Long John. <laughs> exactly. So yep. He's like kind of a bigger name in the British scene. Yes, he had yeah. Rod Stewart in his band. Mm -hmm. And while he is backing up Long, Long John Baldry, Long John has a number one hit in the UK called Let the Heartaches Begin. So Long John, Long John Baldry is this like blues singer. And then he writes this super sappy shit crooner song called <laughs> Let the Heartaches Begin. And it goes number one. And then he just is like, I'm going to completely change up my style and chase the fame and the money that I get from that. And Elton said it's like the worst thing that could have happened to him because it steered him away from what he was truly good at. And I have to put in this anecdote because it's like one of the funniest things. In Elton John's autobiography, it actually starts out talking about his time playing with Long John Baldry. And 
when he's singing this crooner love song, all the women would like flock to the stage and like grab his microphone cord to try to get him to come over. And he was like such a bad performer that he would just like start yelling at them about how he was going to charge them 50 pounds if they broke his microphone and like screaming at them. At one point, he actually just like literally smashed a woman in the head with the microphone who was grabbing his cord. It's like, come on, man. Now, uh, potentially, and I don't know how much these things are connected, but Long John Baldry was openly gay which was an anomaly at the time. Not a lot of people were openly gay. And I think he was just not at all swayed by the concept of like a bunch of women wanted to get with him. He's like, play off my fucking microphone, lady. I don't care about you. <laughs> yeah. So, but to hear Elton John, to hear Elton say it, they went from playing in like these really cool kind of like hip clubs to they get this big hit and they're playing in supper clubs, which are full of like middle-aged oh, people. And man. it's like, everybody's eating dinner and it's, you know, very just stiff and square. And at one, he said it was like cabaret. And then apparently one show in London, Elton, Elton John, who is a shy reserved kid at this point, just fucking loses it. And in the middle of the song, just like flips his, organ over and starts yelling about how he hates this shit and he's gonna fucking quit this band he can't fucking do this anymore he screams fuck this and like goes off the stage <laughs> so elton at this point he's still reg dwight all right and he decides that i have to make it as a professional musician on my own but reg dwight's not a star i need mm. to come up with a different name and so he takes from uh, it takes the John from Long John Baldry and he takes the Elton from Elton Dean, who was the saxophone player in the band and makes the name Elton John. No way. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So both guys that are in the band that he's in, he takes their name. And apparently after his explosion on stage, he still has to like take the bus back from the gig with the guys. <laughs> he tells them all about his name and they just laugh in his face and like, good luck with that. You fucking loser. Like it's never going to happen. <laughs> so he doesn't actually quit bluesology at the time by the way he throws his organ over says fuck this i hate this i'm taking a new name by the way when's the next kick uh, but <laughs> he gets back to he gets back home and he's like i really want to start working as a songwriter and this is one of those famous rock and roll stories where he answers an advertisement in N NME from Liberty Records asking for talent and songwriters. So this is apparently a very weird time in the songwriting industry where for the longest time, that was like a good career that you could have. You write songs, people pay you for those songs, perform the songs. You can make a good living off of that. And apparently, according to Elton in his autobiography, what completely messed that up was Bob Dylan and the Beatles. Because they were the songwriters and they didn't need uh, the songwriters. And then you got the Who coming along and we're like, Who write their own songs too? And that became like the cool thing to do was to write your own songs, to be the whole package in one. And so a lot of these lucrative opportunities are gone because the most, the highest selling stuff is written by the people who are actually performing it and who are actually, uh, you know, singing it. So, so Liberty is kind of in some financial straits at the time. They're trying to adapt in the landscape. They're not particularly adapting well. They are trying to be a progressive rock label. And one of the people that they had actually signed was Jeff Lynn. And oh, ELO. Jeff Lynn, right. yeah, ends yeah. up leaving and forming ELO, but he was working for Liberty Liberty for a while, kind of in that same sort of capacity. He was in a band that was doing some stuff. Yeah. Um, so now he's 20. So you said this is around mid 60s, like 67. So he's around 20 years old. Elton? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Still living with his parents. And so he goes to Liberty. He auditions for them as talent. He's like, I want you to sign me to like a record deal and be talent. And he auditions for this guy whose name is Ray Williams. And Ray Williams is like, no, nah, you're not talent, kid. I'm sorry. And sort of in a way to soften the blow of telling him that he is not talented enough to be signed to the label, he goes, well, how about you just be a songwriter? 
and he just picks an envelope up from a stack of apparently littered envelopes all over the table. Because when he put that ad out, apparently a bunch of poets came out of the fucking woodwork and just sent lyrics in all over the place. And with no thought whatsoever, grabs a random envelope unopened off the table and says, why don't you write songs to this? And it happens to be submission from one Bernie Toppin. No way. Yes. <laughs> Completely total random chance. Not in any way was where they put together because they thought they'd be compatible. He was literally just like, yeah, kid, you don't have what it takes, but you know, eh, maybe try some of this. Just expecting <laughs> to never hear from him again. I feel basically. bad for yeah. you. Take yeah. some yeah. random yeah. scribblings right. that I have on my desk. Yeah. So Bernie Toppin, who is a poet in massive air quotes from Lincolnshire. Toppin is 17 at the time. Jeez. And he had actually come from a very modest background. And honestly, some of the lyrics on this album made a little bit more sense when I realized that he was raised on a chicken farm. And so he was literally a farmer. I'm like, oh. Yeah. It's going back going to his plow, to... dude. Yeah, that exactly. There we yeah. go. And so Elton opens it up and it's just like, this is fucking awesome. I love these lyrics. This is great. And he immediately like puts them all down and writes songs to them and goes back in and like, yeah, these actually aren't that bad. Maybe you and Bernie should like actually meet and they meet, they form an instant friendship. And they are just like, we get each other. We know what the other person's trying to accomplish. We work well together. So, but not in the room together, to be clear, not in that, the room. Can, no, that no, can not never happen. Room. Bernie. Yes, yes exactly. They, they've only met once at that first meeting and the rest is all. Been... That's, that's <laughs> what's hard to believe is they didn't just, Go like, yeah, why don't we get together one time? See how it works. <laughs> well, we'll talk a little bit about how together they were at a point because it's coming up. Um, but they end up developing a very good working relationship. They write a few songs together. Liberty isn't interested in them. However, Ray Williams signs them to like his own publishing company. He's got a separate company aside from Liberty that he has set up. And so he signs them to that publishing company. By, by the way, classic grift for Ray Williams oh, just to be sitting really there at the helm, looking yes. at all the talent, diverting yeah. them to his publishing company. Yes. <laughs> so he signs them, by the way, to a commission only deal. So they're not getting paid unless they actually sell songs. There's zero risk for him whatsoever. He's like, yeah, you work okay. for me. Sell some songs and you get paid. Other than that, like, I don't give a shit. <laughs> And they do sell a few songs, nothing substantial. They're kind of aping the popular psych style at the time. That's not really catching on. They are living together with Elton's mom and his stepdad because his mom was remarried at that point. So they're basically in bunk beds in Elton's room, <laughs> living together, super duper poor. I'm picturing stepbrothers. Yes. Just it boosted. would blow my mind if Elton was still sleeping in a bunk bed, for the record. Yeah. <laughs> like to this day. <laughs> yeah. So again, they had this very peculiar writing style where like Bernie will like write poems and just hand them to Elton and Elton will go away and write the, the melodies. And then they present the songs. They're bumming around at the time with a lot of other super poor musicians and including one who they described as like super pretentious, but very talented and in an attempt to cultivate an air of mystery, he's going by Hans Christian Andersen. And he eventually gets tired of that and changes his name back to John and becomes John Anderson of Yes. Of Yes. Which I thought was really like an interesting little tidbit there. Yeah. Dude, wow. that's crazy. Yeah. So they are being given recording opportunities at this time with Ray Williams Production Company. They get put on a $25 a week retainer to record some songs. You know, that at long last basically lets Elton John quit bluesology. He still hasn't quit bluesology at this point. He finally quits bluesology and he's like, I'm dedicating myself. This is all that I'm going to do. And they eventually get connected with Tony King. And Tony King will become a very important person in Elton's life, but he is a super connected guy. He eventually becomes Elton's um, manager and lover for a period of time. But Tony King is working for a production company that George Martin had set up after basically realizing the Beatles weren't paying him all that much money. So George Martin sets up his own production company. Elton's immediately smitten with him, not only because Tony was also openly gay, which again, we say openly gay in a way that he was like, everybody knew that he was gay. He was not hiding it. Elton was very much closeted at this point. And to hear him say closeted even to himself, 
he was not mm. admitting to himself that he was gay at the time. He was sort of just like, I don't know, I'm just maybe shy or confused or whatever. And so he also has this like really eccentric fashion style. And this kind of becomes the beginning of Elton's sartorial ex excesses where he's like, oh, this guy, Tony, is really like dressing randomly, three scarves on and beads everywhere and shit. He's like, yeah, maybe I should maybe I should flash myself up a little bit and get noticed. Clearly, it gets a little out of control later on in his career. But <laughs> at this point, he's too poor for it to get out of control. But they end up recording some stuff. They release a single called I've Been Loving You in 1968, which flops. But he didn't actually really care about the single selling because he literally pictured this as just an advertisement for his songwriting skills. He's like, maybe somebody else will pick it up or they'll ask me to write a song for them. That's kind of all that he was envisioning at the time. He was not thinking he was ever going to be a solo artist. Now, at this time, Elton John is engaged to a woman named Lyndra Woodrow. And they're engaged. They're planning everything. They've like booked venues. The wedding's coming up. And he goes oh, no. and he meets. Uh, so before, before we even talk about this, the song Someone Saved My Life Tonight by Elton John, great song, is written mm -hmm. about him and Linda. And he, in an attempt to try to get out of this whole engagement, tries to commit suicide. Oh, gee. This sounds way more intense than it really was. Oh, okay. Because to hear him tell it, he tried to gas himself with like the oven gas, but he put a pillow in the oven. He kept the gas on low and he opened all the windows in the room. And it was just like, and it then Bernie found him and was like, help. yeah, right. oh yeah. Like yeah, it would have yeah. taken him days to finally right. asphyxiate from that gas. It was not going to happen. <laughs> but it shows sort of where his mental state was. Yeah. And, but you know, Bernie pulls him out, saves his life. And he goes and he asks Long John Baldry if he'll be his best man at his wedding. And Long John Baldry is sitting there at a club when he's asking him this. He's sitting there kind of like taking it all in. He's like, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, best man. And then he just goes, what the fuck are you doing? You are so <laughs> obviously gay. Oh, and is like yelling at him to the point where they're in this super hip club and people from other tables including a member of the Supremes are like, yeah, Elton, you're really gay. Like, I'm sorry. Like <laughs> oh you, God. like, I know it's tough to admit, but you should not marry that woman. Definitely not. Wow. And that night he gets shit faced at that club. And that night he goes home, breaks up with Linda and he does not see her again for the rest of his life to this point. Wow. wow. He does not see her again. Yes. That is wild. Him and Bernie, who were they were living with Linda. It was him and Bernie and Linda all living together. Him and Bernie move out, move back in with Elton's mom. And apparently he ends up like paying her medical bills in like 2020 or something like that. They have no contact in between like 1970 and or like 1968 and 2020. Wow. Dude, that's crazy. Yeah. So Ooh. during this time, he's also playing as a session musician. And you know, we, you know, you got to be killer to be a session musician. And he talks about that a lot, actually, that being a session musician really put the screws to him in terms of his ability to have to be able to show up and perform immediately. Can't fuck it up or you're not going to get another gig. You're not going to get paid. And this was how he was making all of his money at the point. And during this time, he appears as a backing vocalist on a song that has come up multiple times on our show. Does anybody have a guess as to what that song is? Mm. We can go all the way back to episode one. It is Lily the Pink. No. Oh, <laughs> yes. God, it haunts us to this day. <laughs> I think so we should, for folks cool. who have not listened to episode one, we should probably drop a little Let's just drop a little Lily here. the Pink. Yeah. He wow. did say that it was like a comedy song. It's not supposed to be a real song. Because okay, he doesn't okay. even mention Lily the Pink in his autobiography. He's like, one day you're performing a gospel album. The next day you're doing a comedy album with the scaffolds. And I was like, wait, the scaffolds. Wait, I that sounds that right. I remember I that name. Yeah. The internet sleuth. Because yeah. to be clear, it came up on Led Zeppelin one episode, our very first episode, because that was the hit song at the time the record came out, right? Yes. That was a number one song when Led Zeppelin one. Was released. So you just listened to it audience. It was a number one hit. Yes. 
<laughs> oh, England, get your shit together. All right. So he actually gets another opportunity to record, and this time it is for a full-length album. And that becomes 1969's Empty Sky. And again, he sort of sees this as a chance to get noticed from other musicians so that maybe they'll want to cover his songs or buy more songs from him. The album doesn't do great. It's like not even released in the U.S. until 1975, but he's not discouraged because it kind of wasn't intended to sell. It was intended to be, again, like a resume. Mm -hmm. They get a chance to do another album because the people at the production company are like, actually, this album's not bad. Maybe there's something here that we can make something out of. So instead of Empty Sky, he makes his next album, and they just call it Elton John. And that you can kind of picture as his first chance at really taking a shot of being a solo artist in his own right. And not just, I'm just trying to see if I can get some extra work. So he does Elton John. At first, it isn't selling in the UK. But they get it over to Uni Records in the US. And it actually ends up doing pretty well. So to give you an idea, Elton John has Border Song and Your Song on it. Which also named your fucking songs better, but Border Song and <laughs> continues your song, through this album, by the way. It certainly does. So those are when when Uni Records hears that they're like, these are actually pretty fucking good songs. Like we should bring this guy over to the U.S. and let's see what he can do. And so they end up bringing him over to play in L.A. in August of 1970 at the Troubadour. And it is very important that he played at the Troubadour because in L.A. you have the whiskey. That's where the rock bands play. And you have the mm -hmm. Troubadour. And at the time, the Troubadour was like Joni Mitchell, James Taylor, people like that. Singer songwriters. And Elton John comes in and nobody would say that Elton John is not an electric performer. And he comes in to this relatively staid troubadour environment and blows the fucking doors off the place dude i can't on a imagine show. like can you imagine going on after Joni mitchell like i'm sorry right? <laughs> <laughs> i mean standing probably looked insane you know uh stage yeah. antics compared to her but yeah i can't imagine what he must have looked like in that subdued environment yeah so he brings this high intensity rock and roll show and instantaneously like the there i forget the guy's name but there was a a guy was like a major music writer at the time was like i could not wait until the show was over to leave and write my article about it like it was amazing blew me away and instantaneously <laughs> all kinds of buzz and he is just like a darling on the scene he plays for a week at the troubadour and that basically ends up like his career has just been a steady rise at a 45 degree angle ever since then maybe not ever since then but for the next several years at least right they end up releasing in october 1970 so this is august 1970 that he comes to america for the first time in august 1970 i'm sorry in october 1970 he releases tumbleweed connection now people thought that this was a response to his time in america because it is a very much americana based album but actually they had written and recorded all the songs before bernie or elton had ever been to the u.s and they basically said that they were inspired by music from big pink they were like well, let's try to make ah. a, an album that kind of sounds like music from big pink it sells really well in the u.s and the uk hit seven in the u.s two in the uk he records a live album in november of 1970 he records and releases Madam Across the Water in 1971, which has Tiny Dancer and Levon on it. Uh, then he does a soundtrack for the movie Friends in 1971. In 1972, he releases Honky Tonk Chateau. So he's working hard. And bear in mind, this entire time he is touring and packing houses, bringing high energy. But this is a level of production that I just find to be absolutely fucking insane. I don't understand how you could do that. But by all accounts, again, Every gig is bigger, every album selling better, every crowd is more energized, and so he's living that high. And he said, like, fame is a drug. Fame is a more powerful drug than drugs. And right. so he was addicted to that. He releases Don't Shoot Me, I'm Only the Piano Player in early 1973, and that's kind of a pop-focused album. Some of the other albums have been a little bit more um, kind of like 
honky tonk, soulful. This is more of a pop album. And that becomes Elton's first number one album. And he gets his first number one single with Crocodile Rock. <laughs> I know. Uh, not, like, not one of his best in my yeah, opinion. Right. Okay. It's Agreed. not one of his best, but I can see how it's inoffensive and like it's pop radio. It's a throwback also yeah. to the 50s, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. He remembers when rock was young. Yeah. Sure. Or Bernie does at least. <laughs> so, but that leads us up to the recording of Goodbye Yellow Brick Road in May of 1973. That's when they actually recorded. They had originally intended to record it in January of 1973 when Elton John was living in Jamaica at a hotel for a couple of months. And a couple of things prevented them from doing that. Number one, there was a lot of instability in Jamaica. Number two, there was like a boxing match. I think it was like a George Foreman, Muhammad Ali fight or something like that, or Joe Frazier fight or something like that that prevented them from being able to do that. So Bernie, over the course of two and a half weeks, writes all of the lyrics. So two and a half weeks in January of 1973, he writes the lyrics. And then in January of 1973, Elton writes all of the melodies for this album over the course of three days. Jeez. That's wild. That's fucking that wild. 17 That's songs crazy. in... I mean, he must have had some ideas before that of chord progressions or something, right? Probably. I don't know. Even if he did, that makes it a little bit more like, oh, yeah, of course you put out a double album because you're just like, I just shit out songs all the time. <laughs> <laughs> this will never end. Yeah. <laughs> so instead of recording it in Jamaica, like they were thinking about, they returned to a chateau north of Paris called Studio de Registrement. Uh, I'm pronouncing that terribly, I'm sure. That was um, wonderful. I love it. But All is, our can, you do it, can you do it in a Jamaican accent, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> maybe that would uh, I'm, I'm not touching that. I would not do that. <laughs> the anecdote I heard about why they had to leave Jamaica is they went to the studio where the Rolling Stones had done a record, and they got freaked out because there was, like, zero gear in the place. And they're just, like, setting up the drums, and the engineer's like, go get the one microphone. And like, Wait a minute. I think we need more than that. <laughs> maybe we need to get out of here and go back to Europe. Yeah. Are you kidding me? This is this is Jamaica's one microphone. This is the country. <laughs> microphone, yes. Jamaica was not doing great at the time, um, but this this studio that they're in it, uh, north of Paris is actually where they recorded their two previous albums, and then over the course of two weeks they record twenty two songs, seventeen Man. of which make it on this album. So, the exhaustive history leading up to Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. You guys want to talk about some songs? Let's do it. Let's, Let's do it, man. Talk about some songs. <laughs> 